enjoy and I'm going to share my screen here. <clears throat> oh, is that a of course it's a PowerPoint based presentation. I have to. Here we go. OK, I can see the chat and I can see some other things, but. Um, can you see the um, can you see the PowerPoint slide? Yes. OK, thank you. So. Uh, so this is the session on when things aren't going the way you hoped, you know, a little bit about employee performance improvement. And this follows um, up on two weeks ago where we talked about working towards anxiety free annual performance evaluations. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Gary Dezeal. I work for the University of Vermont Extension, and um, I'm sorry I have came down with a cold virus uh, uh, actually like 10 days ago now. And it's still got a hold on me, so I'm, I apologize for that. And we'll try to mute if I have to, you know, go into a coughing fit or something like that. And um, I don't know if you can see on your screen, but um, on the bottom right is a picture, and there's a there's a little star on 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 my chest here. It says you tried. I actually got a little post-it note with that written on it of uh, one day <laughs> from one of my colleagues um, about reporting that I was trying to do. Um, and so it was a, a gold star. You know, you tried. I needed to be uh, have some performance improvement at that time. So this presentation isn't all about. In fact, it's really all about having employees be successful. And it's much less so about like end of life termination employee discipline. Uh, so I just wanted to frame that. I am going to start <clears throat> with a run a show here. The agenda talk you get a little introduction i'm going to start with some cautions um importance of managing well and then some of those other things and same day summary is i don't know if you've ever heard of it but this is a tool that i'll spend a quite a bit of time on because it's a way to um just get work done as well as helping employees improve their performance as well as the organization your library improving its performance so my first slide is that like, you know, I'm not an attorney, so it doesn't this is I can't give you legal advice. I'm not even a hotshot Lincoln lawyer um, and I cannot give I just can't give legal advice. So and there's a big message here in that. Um, um, that this is a point if you have a performance issue. That rises to the level of really being significant in your in your judgment, then, you know, find human resource support. If you are part of a municipality, hopefully your town may have some HR support. If you are part of a municipality, you certainly are part of the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, and they have very good um, uh, labor attorneys on their on their staff, as well as there should be a town attorney which you should have access to. If you're a nonprofit, an incorporated library, of course, you probably have an attorney that you work with on a number of different things. But um, sometimes when things get rough in HR, then um, attorneys or professional uh, advice from HR resource people is, is needed. So, the first thing, and and I hope that this doesn't take but maybe 30 minutes or so or 35 minutes so that that you can offer suggestions. And as I go through here, you can offer comments or ask questions. And at the end, that will have time for questions because I understand and recognize the the um, expertise in the room here. You know, I, I see that we have about 20 people, 20 participants. And I appreciate the experience that you all have. Um, you've probably been to been to through the school of hard knocks as well as anyone uh, who's been a supervisor or who's been a director or <clears throat> um, had had employees to to manage or if you're a trustee. So what you do every day matters more than what you do once in a while. And that was the message of the annual annual performance evaluation program last year, uh, last year, la two weeks ago, was that, um, you know, open communication, meeting with employees on a regular formal basis 
using precision precision descriptions, communicating well. All these words that I've used before in the last couple years of presentations to the Vermont Department of Library folks and public libraries across the state. These are really important things. You you have to learn how to manage well, and there are definite things that are part of managing well. And um, these these will help keep you keep the employees that report to you successful and keep your library on track from an HR perspective. <clears throat> so I'm going to go right over to the same day summary, which is I, I think is this like this fantastic thing. And I think that you've probably all used this before, <clears throat> but maybe you didn't have a name for it. And I draw a lot on this uh, former employee uh, employment attorney. His name is Jathan Janov. Sorry, I'm looking to the right beer because that's where my my screen is. But um, this this fellow writes a lot. He's, he write, writes a lot of articles. He is not a fan of progressive progressive discipline, and so he comes up with all sorts of other strategies that are more humane, that are easier to follow, and um, that make a lot of just a lot of sense. And um, after the session today, I will send Joy a series of documents from the Society for Human Resource Management that uh, Mr. Janov has written that will help you understand and, and give you this uh, background to understand these things more fully. Because I understand this is a very quick run through and it's hard to learn um, and remember, but if you have the documentation, it will be helpful to you, I think. So first we stop at this is Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve. I, I know Jeanette is on the in the in the crowd, so I'm sorry about my my German pronunciation. But why we keep forgetting, and what we can do about it. Now I'm just going to talk about why we keep forgetting. So <clears throat> I love this this slide: information retained over time elapsed. So memories weaken over time. Biggest drop happens right after you learn it. So when you go to have lunch, you may not remember a lot of this. It's easier to remember things that have meaning to you. So, you know, it's what somebody may be talking about, just a chit chat or this like you have no idea what that person said after the, you know, an hour goes by or two hours or three hours. Uh, but if you had a special human interest or you were interested, you remember that you go home, you talk to your partner or whoever about that. Um, the way something is presented affects your learning. This is a you know a adult learning sort of thing. If you're if you're doing something or if you're or, or actively learning is different than just getting presented with information. And how you feel affects how you how you learn. Um, if you're exhausted, if you're not feeling well, you learn less. So the takeaway on that is the is the same. So the same day summary is built upon that. Is like. Um, you know, you do it the same day that you meet with the employee. So we're going, I'm going to, use, I'll show you an example after this slide, but a same day summary is very short and to the point. So the summary I'll show you is like somebody is late for work, you know, a really basic kind of, kind of um, <clears throat> uh, situation that might happen and a very quick summary by email to that employee about the discussion about being late that sent to the employee as um, you know just a, a, a summary. And in fact, Mr. Janov says same hour summary is even better. You just had the had the conversation, write down a quick email, off it goes. Plus you print out the email, put it in the personnel file, and that helps you uh, create that memory um, and documented memory. In, in a file. So list key takeaways. You write it as soon as possible and the re recipient is invited to add anything that they might, you know, that was um, omitted, wasn't correct, or they saw a different perspective. Um, and I have I have links on all these slides that should be active when I send you the, uh, the PDF of this, but I'm also including these articles in a packet that I'll send to Joy. And on the bottom left here is like, don't limit the SDS to employee discipline. This you could 
do this, and it's, it's really helpful in any kind of situation where you met with an employee, you decided on, on an action, and you just wanted to codify it, follow up on it, make it known that everybody's kind of on the same page. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is an example of uh, uh, an email that, um, that is sent as a same day summary. And this is from, uh, you know, yourself to an employee. It was yesterday, so it's kind of late. You know, if you want to do this yesterday, that actually was sent yesterday too. So you had the conversation. Here's, the, it's very, very short and sweet. Here's the summary. Let me know if I miss something. And then it goes on to dis describe, you know, you've been late. You're late last Tuesday. Here it is. You gave me the insurance that you will do what's necessary so that I can rely on, you know, you being here on the scheduled time. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the library has to open, right? At the open time. Um, so this is an example, quick example of a, of a same day summary. <clears throat> now, as you go forward, so what happens if they're late, you know, two weeks from now? Well, you continue with the same day summary until in your judgment, you feel it's time for um, really some sort of structure around that that has very specific measurements and a timeline and how it's going to be reviewed. So that's, you know, a performance improvement plan, which we'll talk about in a few more slides. And another thing I, I'm not going to talk about here, but I'm going to include it in the documentation that you'll have, is following up on a same day summary. This author, Jan O, talks about the no fear confrontation. So this is when the SDS, you know, if you sent several about the same topics, you keep documenting what's been happening. Then you start with another, it's sort of like a, uh, SDS a bit on steroids. So you frame, you explore, acknowledge, and respond. You know, you frame the problem, you're late, you say you're not going to be late, but you're late here, here, and here. You know, we talked about this, we documented it. Why is this happening? This isn't working for the library, it wasn't work for me, you know, and then the acknowledgement is actually the employee acknowledging that you understand their perspective and then responding. Again, I'm not going to be talking about this, but I will include it in the documentation. Here are some common mistakes about a same day summary. You know, wordiness, like you don't want to go on and on. You don't want to mask the message in too many nouns, adjectives, and verbs. You want to state what you've spoken about very concisely. You're not going to opine or embellish or reflect upon what's going on. You're just stating what it is. It's not a substitute for conversation and you never delay. <clears throat> and this is where uh, I don't, if you remember back to that slide with all those words about good management, one of the key management traits, and I have to admit that I have sometimes been low on this one, is courage. Sometimes you have to have the courage to be a supervisor, to be a leader, and um, to really, to be very fair to all the employees, to treat the employees the same, and not to delay on something that is bothering you. Because if that employee is late and you don't say anything, it's really just a, it's gone after a day or two you just can't go back in time it's so much better to do it right away so moving from a, a same day summary or same hour summary it's going to go into performance improvement plans so this is there's a lot of organizations that use performance improvement plans uh, some Organizations don't call them performance improvement plans. They call them progressive discipline. That's what University of Vermont has. It's called progressive discipline. <clears throat> and instead of a performance improvement plan, I 
think that the performance improvement plan can eventually lead to termination or something else. Um, but um, is this, to, in my mind, this sounds a little bit better, right? A performance improvement plan. We're dedicated to your success. So I'm going to call it a PIP to be a short uh, performance improvement plan. You know, the questions are, but first, is it, a, is it an appropriate thing to do? You know, um, the SDSs haven't worked. The conversations haven't worked. So the first question is, do you want them to succeed? So the whole point of a PIP, of progressive discipline, is for employee success and library success. So you, you don't do the PIP if you're not committed to having the employee succeed. Then you look at other ways. That, then I think you're just deciding that the employee doesn't fit and that you're headed towards a termination. <clears throat> is it documented? So is there actual performance or behavior issue that can be substantiated? This is where those regular monthly meetings and, and the SDSs come into play. You, you just have to have a history in your folder, personnel folder. Otherwise, you're just at C. You just, you, you really have to have it documented. <clears throat> Excuse me with specific examples. And in my last presentation two weeks ago, an annual performance evaluation, one of, the, one of my rules, cardinal rules, is there's no surprises, that the employee should know all about what's in there because of the regular meetings. If there's a performance issue, they know that, it's, that they got one. With the SDS's documented example, when you start a professional improvement plan, I think it's a lot less intimidating because they they know they've not, there's been a lot of discussion about this can it be fixed so here's another thing that you'll have to use your judgment on um uh, when i read documentation about performance improvement plans there's things that you read about insolence and insubordination may not lend themselves very well to a performance improvement plan if it's a behavioral issue versus getting tasks done. I mean, if it's attitude, it's a really difficult thing to deal with <clears throat> through a performance improvement plan. And then when you think about a performance improvement plan, well, wait, is it, do I have a responsibility as a supervisor to make sure that this person is trained better to do the work that they're doing? Or has something really impacted them on their personal life, which is, you know, there's this, this point in their professional life where they're like not doing very well, <clears throat> they're really underperforming, but it may be because of something that can, that will be remedied, that there's just in this dip. So use your humanity when, you, when you're thinking about bringing somebody into a performance improvement plan. And also think about also your own role in making them successful. Do they have the training they need? Do they have all the tools that they need and the resources they need to get the job done. So here's uh, going again, a performance improvement plan. Talking about core competencies. These are things that an uh, employee would be evaluated against and um, guided by in their in their daily in their daily work annual work at the monthly meetings here's some core competencies from the park county library public library system um you know and i've got a little arrow to working relationships because that was <clears throat> in a previous slide uh from a previous talk but like the core competency here is related to an expectation a standard of behavior like reliability number six Reliability, the standard is that you show up to work on time or a little before time so that you're at your station on time, that you do the work that you're supposed to do, that you treat patrons the way you're supposed to treat them, that sort of thing. You know, there's standards. So the SDS, the community, the conversations have shown that this employee is just not reaching uh, a standard, a minimum standard. Um, that's expected of them. You'll also see that 
there's a lot of um, links that I put in throughout this. This templatelab.com performance improvement plan is it's a fairly long document, but it's 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 very helpful. And I also have one from Vanderbilt University. And I think the the template that they use off this one is from the University of Maryland. <clears throat> So here are the here are the steps. You define the concern. You know what the standards for that competency are that must be met. And you identify the changes that have to be made. So those are those are based on the documentation. Um, you know, they're not doing a specific task correctly. They're not working with patrons as you'd like them to work. Um, and then uh, using that gap between what's happening and the standard, you work to establish SMART goals. So this is really important. They, they have to be specific, although those four or five words are specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. That is time constrained. That they, you know, it can't go off into an, it, infinity. Attainable. They could be reach goals, but they're attainable. Realistic, yes. Can this person do it? Is it within the realm of possibility? Yes. Measurable, yep. Measure and specific. So also establish like <clears throat> what kind of resources are needed. Do they have to have some training? Is there something on niche, niche academy that could be helpful to them? Or what the Department of Libraries has in their store of, of resources? Um, <clears throat> people they could learn from, other colleagues in the, in the, in the system. Um, Timetable for meeting the standard is also, um, you know, all these these things are really important. Another, so in step number five, as you go through this, say that, you know, that, that it's a, a two month process and there's certain steps along there what, that way. It's important to provide consistent um, feedback and also feed forward, get, you know, to, 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 it's not, to get information from them. It's a two way street, good communication. And um, and to evaluate, have a formal evaluation somewhere in the middle of this to let the know, know you're going to be letting the employee know how they're doing because you probably uh, increase the number of formal meetings with them over this period. Or you should if you've had one a month, you go maybe to two a month or weekly if you have to, whatever you have to do or whatever you feel is appropriate. But there is a point um, that you should have it uh, very well documented. Of course, every time you meet with the employee, you'll have a quick summary, but then there should be a formal point, maybe halfway the process where it's documented. And then at the end, all through this process, the employee will know how they're doing and you'll know how the employee is doing. And, um, and at some point, though, you'll have to just decide where you've if you've met where you're uh, where you wanted to head. <clears throat> I'm seeing a comment from Jeanette. If I remember correctly, in a past workplace, the PIP was required in the process of working with an underperforming person. It is tough to do when it's mostly attitude. That's right. Yeah, larger organizations often have these well, they have an HR department, right? That will give supervisors guidance. And supervisors, um, for instance, at uh, University of Vermont, you don't just decide you're going to have an employee in a performance improvement uh, plan in progressive discipline. It is um, <clears throat> highly, um, highly controlled by HR services at UVM. And um, very specific things have to be met. And you would never do it in a vacuum. Um, you'd always be under the under the um, guidance and control of HR. Excuse me. Um, so here are some points, do's and don'ts for performance improvement plan. Um, don't procrastinate. Again, you're going to hear that over and over, right? Be timely. <clears throat> um, I see this was at a large university, not UVM. Yes. Oh, I forgot that Jeanette, you worked for UVM 
medical and <clears throat> the school of medicine, I believe, at one point. Um, consider uh, same day summary, same hour summaries first. I didn't, well, I didn't specifically mention it, but it was on one of the first slides about confidentiality. This is a, this is a huge thing. Um, anything about personnel should be need to know basis only. Um, so as much as possible, <clears throat> keep it very private and uh, keep it confidential. Um, it would be helpful, I think, in a, in a library situation with trustees to have a smaller personnel committee that could uh, handle personnel issues if, um, you know, if they came up. So that would limit kind of the uh, spread of information to those that didn't have to know. Um, and um, <clears throat> also uh, from confidentiality, personnel records should be stored in a locked cabinet. And personnel records should never have medical information about employees. Medical information um, should be stored in a different folder in a different uh, cabinet, different place. <clears throat> I like the, the question, UVM isn't a large university. Uh, no, I went to the University of Wisconsin. That's a large university. A little, little aside there, 45,000 students. Um, keep it as simple and direct as possible. <clears throat> Provide, we talked about providing formal written re uh, um, review, reasonable time, you know, for the employee to demonstrate improvement. And, um, and I know that you'll do this. I mean, you, we always try to do this, is that we this highlight positive aspects of people's work. We highlight how they <clears throat> contribute to the team and how it impacts positively our patrons and our library. Um, <clears throat> so it's these are these are difficult things to go through. I've I've conducted um, performance improvement plans in my past as a supervisor, and they're difficult. Some of them have led to terminations, and others have ended up with a happy story. Um, but it always is very difficult, especially for the person in this performance improvement plan. They know it's not it's not a good thing. Uh, you can put yourself in their shoes. It's 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 embarrassing. It, it, it's it's you know, it's just something you don't want to happen to you to be put in a performance improvement plan. So please think with humanity and um, think about other ways the communication that you can do before you get to this point. Um, are there any questions? I think I'm going to switch. Yeah, I'm going to switch briefly to progressive discipline. Um, after this, just looking. And we'll have plenty of time for conversation. Oh, it looks like Jeanette has her hand up. Yeah, just have comments. Do you want me to hold them uh, until after or no. should I toss them in now? Yeah, good. Right now. Yeah. OK, um, so, you know, I can't resist because PIP is something I've done a lot, unfortunately, over my career. Um, so just a few things to add for bits of advice. Um, whenever wordiness, you, Gary, you mentioned is is a real issue, and I think whenever we have difficult conversations, we kind of tend to stumble over ourselves with wordiness because it's a difficult conversation and we're kind of trying to smooth things out. It's really helpful to write talking points for yourself before you have difficult conversations. Well, that's a good lesson for any situation, but when you have personnel uh, conversations, be prepared with your own talking points and make really sure that you don't use feeling language. I feel, I sense, uh, because it just it weakens your argument and it makes it very personal. But if you say you have come in late four out of five days this week, it is really imperative to the mission of the library that you be here on time. Take everything out that is personal. It will also help them feel less personally attacked and it makes for a smoother conversation. So that's one thing I wanted to add. Um, 
I also have engaged people, recipients of the PIP a little bit in setting goals and in having them address to me how they can achieve the expectations, which makes it a little bit more humane, but it really depends on the person. Uh, sometimes you just have to say, these are my expectations. These are the goals. This is the timeline and they can't be involved. But if you have hope that a PIP will work, then you should be able to engage the person in the process and make them feel like they have some say in it as well. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeanette. I, I just t you want to speak anytime. You just speak up. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, Gary and I were going to do this presentation together, and I just didn't have the capacity. So, so sorry, <laughs> Gary. <laughs> No, no, it's wonderful to get your perspective because I do know that you've, uh, you know, you've been through these quite a few times and um, I, I really like, especially the goal setting. Yeah, it's a two way straight. It's not you setting the goal. There are expectations, of course, so maybe it is a place where you do set the goals. But having that like that first sentence of the SDS, right, the same day summary, you know, did I get this right? Am I understanding correctly? Do you have anything else to add? You know, um, having it that communication really, really helps. Another thing I was thinking of, and this goes on the opposite end of of how serious it can be, is I've met with another a, a representative of HR with the employee, so it's a three person thing rather than a two person thing. It is very much more intimidating to the employee. But if your judgment says, based on this behavior, I need a third party to be there, then that, that's really important. That, so that's where you go back to my slide number three, is having legal advice, real legal advice, and um, HR uh, professional help is, is, it can be very helpful. You had something else to say, Jeanette? No, okay. I, was there another question? I thought I saw a hand up. <clears throat> no, okay, I'll go forward, except Joy is typing. So we'll keep an eye on that. Maybe it's quicker if I just say. OK, right, maybe it's quicker if I just say it. I'm wondering about unions and how they play oh. into this at all, like how many people can be there and any other yeah. aspects that the union yeah. might play into this. Yeah, you know, it's sort of it's mentioned actually on my second or my last slide <clears throat> when we talk. I talk, I have a slide on can you fire somebody right away? Um, but um, it, that is a really good point, Joy, because personnel policy often describes grievance procedures. And a union contract, I'm a, I'm a union member, my collective bargaining agreement is the personnel handbook. It's like, if it isn't in that contract, then there's like, I guess you'd have to have attorneys talk to attorneys about what the basis of any action is. So this is a very good point, Joy. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll say it again in a, in a, in a slide or two. Um, Performance improvement plan, I'm going to move to the next slide is progressive discipline. I didn't really want to talk very much about this. And sometimes you run into this or hear about it more if there's like a, depending on the severity of the incident, um, you know, how to go about it, a violation of a law, the policy violation. And, and this is actually <clears throat> UVM's uh, process. There's a verbal warning, which actually is written. I'm going to turn off my mic just for a second. Sorry. Um, and that, ironically, as I said, is a written thing, but it's a verbal warning, a written warm warning, and then a final warning and termination. So this is pretty serious stuff. And um, again, I've got a little note on the bottom of that slide. This is where you need an attorney even more or professional HR help. Um, if you're a uh, municipal library, you've got that access to Vermont League of Cities and Towns, which is wonderful. If you're incorporated, then I think that you have your own uh, legal folks that might do pro bono work for you or paid work on occasion. 
that, that you can access. There are also specific labor attorneys, of course, in the private sector. But this is really like not fun when you get to these points. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, for those who have been through this. Then I, I just wanted to throw in this slide because I, I thought there might be a question about like, can you fire somebody without warning? And I've done, I've, I started my first job 41 years ago for University of Wisconsin Extend, no, for Extension, yeah. And um, this wasn't the job I had, but I, there was only one time I can think where I fired somebody on the spot. And they were uh, an hourly employee, so different different kind of um, laws surrounding that, different kinds of expectations about that. And they had broken a policy that that disabled them from working for us. They 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 lied on an application, an employment application, saying that they had a driver's license, and um, and they needed a driver's license to drive. A vehicle for us and uh in a background check they had been working for a few weeks i got a call from the head office saying uh, we did background checks on everybody for driver's license and this person's uh, suspended so had to had to fire them right away they couldn't they couldn't do their job um breaking the law <clears throat> um Maybe there's a joke at UVM is that you, you don't get terminated on the spot at UVM unless you've got an open bottle of alcohol on your desk. Um, I am. Um, I, there's a mugshot of me there with a bag of money. I. Um, one of our employees was embezzled um, forty five thousand dollars and um, not a good story. But we didn't fire them on the spot. We put I went up there with a chief internal auditor and we put them on administrative leave on the spot, even paid leave to begin with, and then unpaid leave <clears throat> as facts became more evident that led to termination. So there's a lot to consider. Um, you know, Vermont is an at-will state. The employee can leave the employer for no reason. The employer can leave the employee for no reason. That being said, you can get into all sorts of trouble by just terminating somebody without warning. I've been through that. And um, so look to your personnel policy and procedure. As Joy just brought up, is there union membership? Is there a contract? And also think about like, is, is this discrimination? Are there uh, federal medical, you know, is there a medical thing that could, has happening that the employees protected? <coughs> Are there implied agreements like we sort of imply that we'd hire you for, you know, six months? Um, so there's a lot to consider <clears throat> with firing on the spot. And um, and usually things that are really egregious <laughs> lead to administrative leave first and then fact finding and termination because everybody um, kind of deserves a due process. <clears throat> Sorry about that. To remember to put my mic on mute. Um, I want to. I don't think I have anything more to say about. It. See if there's a. Um, oh, I see Cindy Weber. Thank you, Cindy. Still follows the progressive discipline process. Never did document, document, document. So yes, right. The SDS is is a really, um, I think, a really positive tool to use in documentation. Because it also, it invites the perspective of the employee. <clears throat> it's done immediately so that there's like, this is the issue. We know it's an issue, we spoke about it today. And um, very helpful, you're right. Um, clarifying that you use the PIP before the verbal warning. Yeah, I, I sort of consider the PIP you know, in the PIP, um, Sue, you'll see examples <clears throat> where the language towards the end says, like, if you don't reach these goals, it could lead to further actions, including termination. So it's almost interchangeable, <clears throat> but different organizations have different. So 
the PIP actually is kind of using the same word as progressive discipline in many ways. It just, um, you know, progressive discipline. Oh, I, I'm in progressive discipline. That's awful. I'd rather like get the star, you know, you tried, but we have to improve your performance so that you can be successful here. Progressive discipline sounds like, yeah. Yeah, we'll start with the verbal warning, but I want you out. So it has a little different feeling for me. In the examples that I'll send, it does, it shows you the language that's used <clears throat> about termination. Did that, I hope that answered your question, Sue. And Jeanette, if you have any other comments or anyone else have any comments, like I appreciate Cindy writing in there about what happens there. Jeanette. I have more of a question um, about the PIP because I've also bumped into this. Sometimes you bump into this where you 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 do a PIP and the person who receives it will improve their performance just enough <laughs> to be compliant, if you will. Um, yeah. And that's really challenging. And I don't think I've ever gotten to the bottom of how to how to deal with that just enough. And and maybe as a as a boss, I have to be happy with that and say, OK, they're coming in just on time. They're getting just enough done. And if I'm arguing that this is what's needed for the mission of the organization, then maybe I just need to stand stand back and say, OK, you're not going to change your attitude. You're doing what I've asked of you. So I don't know, Gary or others, if you have any experience with that. Yes, yes, I like what Cindy writes, the subtleness and messiness of of HR, of humans. Um, and that's I, I really I'm kind of laughing because it's just like, oh, I know when I've done that. It's just like courageous Gary. It's just like we've got recidivists here. They, they, they're like, I remember there was one employee I had a long time ago that was like, they, you, you talk to them about a problem and like literally in the next hour, you'd be getting, you know, work from them. Look, I did this, I did this. And then like a few weeks later, it's just like, they've gone back again. And um, courageous Gary always used to, with those kinds of employees, <laughs> would sort of hope for the best that they, you know, maybe look at there's other opportunities out there. Um, <laughs> and you'd hope that they leave the organization. They're not like a drag, but they, they are a bit. So it's just like, they're a hard one to, to, to measure. And then <clears throat> you've, I've heard like the, the mantra of like, you spend 80% of your time on those employees that like can make the next grade that really respond to support appreciation they got the skills they got the attitude that will make them go and um but you still got to keep that other employees feet to the fire i think if they're like in that gray area i think as a supervisor you kind of have to well you have to feel about what you what you want to do what kind of time you want to spend on that employee that's a really good reminder because the temptation is to spend, of course, it, this all of this takes time, what you talked about, and it takes brain space and the 2 a.m., you know, you're awake in the night because they keep you up and it shouldn't be that way, right? We shouldn't spend a majority of our time on on the the problem people that need more help, but really help the ones that have promise and that do the work and help elevate them and move them on into the next whatever their next step is. So that's that's a good reminder. It's easy yeah. to just give in to this and only focus on them. Yeah. And then go back. If you have a um, somebody you can talk to confidentially, attorney, HR, personnel committee, somebody you can talk to that you know it's not going anywhere. Reflect on these things. They they just talking about that can help you help you get make your way through. Because if you're a supervisor, it's you know. I mean, it's usually a, a bed of roses. I mean, literally, with all those thorns. And I, I mean, also, you can be just, you can be very fortunate. You've hired well, you've got the right people. I had fantastic employees, and so does Jeanette. And um, and it really, it's just, it's amazing how, how that your life can be when you have 
amazing employees. You can actually be a slacker. Oh, did I say that? No. No, you can't be. An HR director in Stowe, that's fantastic, Cindy. <clears throat> you know, the, the challenge across Vermont again is with our small municipalities, there really isn't very many resources in, in, in many places, as you well know. <laughs> um, I better get going, huh? Well, you'll be glad to see that the last slide is thank you. Um, so uh, it's, it's the end of the presentation. So if there's any conversation or other uh, stump the chump kinds of questions, then then let's ask away. I'll stop sharing this. Cindy, you have your hand up, I see. Hi. Hi, Cindy. Is it okay if I share this information with our HR director? I think it's really valuable stuff that I think that we could start incorporating throughout the departments. Yeah, you certainly may. And there will be those other PDFs. There's going to be like six or seven documents coming your way. And okay. if they're an HR director, they're probably a member of uh, SHREM, Society okay. of HR Management. And yep. this is where all these documents <clears throat> are found. Okay, great. So, I'll talk to yeah. them about that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And of course, they're probably trained and they know about this stuff too. They have yeah. different ideas and they say, yep. oh, that Gary, what's he doing? Hi, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I appreciate it because I, I think this is really valuable stuff. It kind of, it takes the emotion out of it and you just kind of start doing it as a process. I like that. Yeah, yep. Great. Thank you, Cindy, for your Thank comments. You. I see Joy put in this uh, evaluation. I'm going in there and I'm going to rate uh, rate it really highly, but I, I need, you know, uh, it, it sort of uh, skews the curve a little bit. Um, but thank you for everybody for putting in um, your evaluation. Wait a few more, a few more seconds or minutes. Hi, Patty. Hi. I couldn't find the raise hand um, um, icon. Um, I just had a question about um, the more information about nonprofit libraries. Like, what if they don't have a regular attorney to to run things by? Um, I just had questions about that. Yeah. As far I think. I think that a need for an attorney it pops up occasionally, so I, I think it would be good best kind of business practice and good due diligence to at least know who the resource might be. For instance, I had a list about labor attorneys based on some issue I was dealing with four or five years ago. I'd never used the labor attorney, but um, you know, to have those resources to make the contacts, to at least know that you can rely on, you know, fall back on somebody to talk to. And of course, it's a budgetary question too, right? Um, and how do you budget for legal costs? You, oftentimes, you don't know what's going to hit you until you're hit with it. And um, <clears throat> so that's where, in, especially in a nonprofit situation, reserve funds could be very helpful. In a municipality, it would be a different kind of story. You'd be, um, you'd be um, covered by the municipality, or should be covered by the municipality. Um, so, are you a municipal library? Or you're no, you're not incorporated. Sorry about that. No, um, I'm with the Waterville Town Library now, which is um, Town library. municipal library. Okay. So Yep. And as a member of the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, that's, you know, the Municipal Assistance Center is, is fantastic in, in resources. Yeah, no, thanks. I mean, we're all, we're very small. We have no paid staff, but it, yes, this yes. information is helpful. <laughs> Thank yes, you. I, I hike in Waterville, so I know exactly how big it is. Okay. <laughs> Plenty of woods. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. Oh, that, uh, you're welcome, Patty. And I see um, Jeanette put a really good point in there is EAP. Um, <clears throat> it may, I don't know if EAP does. EAP certainly would be good for personal support as well as referrals to personal legal counsel. But I don't know about institutional legal counsel. It's a good question. I actually used EAP to contact an attorney for estate planning. And like I had a, a coupon. So it's surprising what you can get through EAP. And I, I think, yeah, Cindy, I think I, I agree with you, I think. <laughs> Thanks, Cindy. Jeanette? Okay, Joy, you want to take take it? Oh, EAP, Patty, uh, that's Employee Assistance Program. It's generally offered <clears throat> through um, through health insurance or other contracts with an organization. And um, as uh, Cindy, uh, I think Cindy pointed out, it's it's available through VLCT. I'm I'm pretty I'm almost certain of it because I've asked through my town when I was a trustee. Okay, if there aren't any other questions, we will wrap it up and the recording will be posted with the other resources that Gary's mentioned and the slides on our website and on Niche Academy. So thank you all for coming and as always, Gary, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks everybody. Have a good rest of your day before the big chill. <laughs>